Today, friends, we're not going to be in the Psalms. I want to go to the book of Acts, chapter 17. Uh, my message is entitled, How to Talk to Smart People. You ever run into smart people? There's, it seems to be a precious commodity of smart people, but there's a growing community of people who think they're smart. Maybe I should say how to address those guys. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, we're in Acts chapter 17, and um, the scene opens... The great apostle Paul and his missionary band, they're ministering in Europe. They're in a place called Thessalonica, the city of Thessalonica. And uh, he's preaching the gospel. And guess what? There, we have a group of very envious people, envious Jews, that don't like Paul's message very much. It's yanking attention off of them and placing it on Jesus. And these people don't like that. It's just like the people who engineered the judicial murder of Jesus, you know. Uh, we're told in Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, that even Pontius Pilate, the pagan, he knew that it was for envy that they had delivered Jesus to him. These, it's the same spirit of envy, uh, of envy in these people operating. So what did these guys do? These opponents of the Gospel in Thessalonica, they gathered together a mob and they threatened to assault Paul. And that's very easy to do. You're going to find out that nothing is new under the sun. You know that? People are bored and restless, and they're just looking for something to do. And uh, you can give them something meaningful to do, or you can give them something that's terrible to do, but they're just bored. And uh, this is what happened. They gathered a group together, and Paul had to get out of there. And so he was sent away to a place called Athens, Athens, Greece. And... Um, who did he encounter there? Who did Paul encounter in Athens? He encountered the smart people. We'll put that in quotes. The smart people. The Greek philosophers. The Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers. The supposedly deep thinkers. Intelligentsia. And these guys really did regard themselves as being just a little better than other people. They're racists, by the way. They're Athenians. They're Greeks. They're much better than those Northland barbarians, you know. That's what they thought of themselves. So much better. And, uh, well, Paul showed up there. And I want to read about it. Acts chapter 17 and verse 16. Look what happened. Uh, let's back up. Yeah, 16. Verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them, that's a portion of his missionary team. While Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Now that right there, that is the natural, appropriate response of a person whose mind has been rewritten by God and whose heart has been born again, regenerated by God. Uh, Paul was not the least bit interested, and nor should we be, by the way, in showing people how smart he was, how learned he was. He was not uh, interested in winning arguments either to show what a clever uh, debater he was. Paul was not the least bit interested in those things. Rather, Paul was concerned that he wanted to see God glorified in that place, and he wanted to see people in right relationship with God. That's the point. So Paul was absolutely provoked because God was being dishonored there. The creator of the heavens and the earth was being ignored. He was being blasphemed, really, because people deliberately and intentionally turned their face away from him and his self-disclosure in nature and in their heart of hearts. And instead, they crafted deities of their own liking, idols, and they worshipped those things. So Paul was provoked because God was not being honored. In fact, he's being dishonored. And the people themselves were wasting their lives with things that were less than useless, really. You know that? Less than, worse than useless. Uh, they were religious, but they were lost. And that's what man-made religion will do for you, you know. It'll inoculate you against the truth. You craft a conception of ultimate reality that you like, and then you craft a way to get there, a way to commune with that conception you, that you've created. And then uh, you think you're fine. You convince yourself you're fine. That's why uh, God speaks through his man, Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 9. He says, through deceit, these people refuse to know me. That's self-deceit. The easiest person on the earth to deceive is yourself. Really? It's a funny thing. Well, what did Paul do when he, when he saw this? He was so provoked. 
Paul actually cared about those people. He didn't want them wasting their lives. He didn't want them wasting their eternities. Paul didn't want to see God dishonored in this way either. So what did Paul do? Uh, did he threaten those people? <laughs> did he come in there and threaten them and manipulate them? That's what cult leaders do, you know. They manipulate people. I, I really have no time for um, these little schemes and gimmicks that you see some church leaders doing. You, you know, the, the, hey, play some soft music while I'm talking here. Let's really manipulate these people. Let's really tug at their emotions, hey? And all this kind of, there's little tricks that the people re, uh, resort to. And I'd rather just stand here and tell you the truth. Because I believe in, with all my heart that you're an image bearer of God and God created you personally to receive his word. You've been programmed to receive God's word in a way that no animal ever could or ever will. We're special, see, in the created order. I'll just stand here and give you truth. And we'll let God's word and God's spirit handle the rest. Did Paul threaten the people? No. Did he manipulate them? No. Did he flatter them? There's another approach, hey? I'll just tell you all kinds of things about yourself that you want to hear, and you'll fill my church. Because week by week, I don't tell you anything hard. I just say good things that you want to hear. Did Paul resort to that kind of tactic? No. Was he insulting and combative? No, he wasn't. The, Paul was none of those things, dear friends. I want to show you what he did. Look at verse 17. Acts 17, verse 17. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Oh, that's what Paul did. He reasoned with people. He reasoned. Friends, the Bible is our founding document, and it's our playbook. We resort to the Bible. We watch God's men and women, see how they operate under God, see what they did. We're supposed to follow them, look at their examples and follow them. Paul reasoned with these people. We're instructed to share, discuss, yes, even defend our faith, if need be. How? Reasonably, intelligently, in accordance with the basic and widely accepted canons of logic. We're supposed to be reasonable people. We're supposed to be able to give a, a reason for the hope that's in us, see? And where are we getting this from? Well, ultimately, we're getting it from God himself, because you remember God's man, Isaiah? He recorded God's message for the people, and you remember what God told the people? He said, come now, let us reason together, Isaiah 1.18. Now, who is the God, who's God even addressing there? He's addressing people who are hostile to him and his moral prescriptions and his claims. That's who God is actually uh, reaching out to there. And he says, I, I want us to reason. Dear, dear child, let's talk. Let's talk about things. I, it's as though God is saying, I made you. I gave you your rational and cognitive faculties. And I can talk to you and you can understand. Therefore, you're culpable when you turn your face away from me and you don't want to talk. Because, dear child, you have a serious problem. I'm here to help you. I mean, this is, I'm paraphrasing, but this is the whole theme of the Bible. God says, you've got problems, and they're infinite in gravity, but I can help you. And the sad fact is, most just sort of turn their face away from this, and it doesn't occupy too much time, really, in their thought. But I want to say that how, I find this very strange. How strange this is that many people in the world, maybe most people now, I'm not sure, they see Christian faith as somehow antagonistic to reason, that uh, believing the Bible or trusting in God is somehow irrational. I find it very strange when the Bible itself says, reason with people, talk to people intelligently. Don't contradict yourself. Uh, don't use fallacies when you're arguing, when you're trying to make a point. Speak reasonably, rationally with people. That's what the Bible pre prescribes for us. How weird, how strange that we're considered to be the irrational folks out there. The superstitious, irrational, non-thinking people. Well, Paul's going to show us how he interacted with people like this. Look, please, at verse 18 in your Bibles. Verse 18. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him and said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, that's the Mars Hill Council, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians 
and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else either to tell or to hear some new thing. Well, nothing new under the sun, <laughs> really. People have not changed in 2,000 years. We're the same. <laughs> I think it's a little bit ironic, somewhat ironic, that you have the philosophers there, the Epicureans and the Stoics. These two groups of philosophers have very, very different conceptions of reality. Nevertheless, they're regarded as the deep thinkers. They're the philosophers. They're regarded as uh, people who know how to think. But it turns out they're nothing of the sort, are they? It turns out they're actually bored time wasters. They're actually intellectually dull. They're even un unable to understand Paul's message. They've got their own pre-commitments about what reality is like, so they're only half listening to Paul. All they want to do is see or hear some new thing, and they're, and they're half listening to it. Anyone hear of the iPhone? <laughs> Almost a blight on the Western world. People can't take their faces away from their screens. They just want to hear or see some new thing, and they're half listening to everything. They've become intellectually dull. Just like, they couldn't even understand. Paul's message is not hard, is it? You could call it stupid if you want, but it's really not that hard to understand. Paul preaches the same message in every one of his epistles. Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. It's not hard to understand. Jesus died for our sins. He died. He was buried. He rose again. Died for our sins. Rose for our justification. There you have it. Believe and be saved. Easy. That's, that's an easy message. These dull so-called philosophers thought that Paul was talking about two distinct gods. Well, who's, what's this babbler talking about? He's talking about a god named Jesus and another god called Resurrection. Well, we never heard of these gods before. Half listening, couldn't care less. Entertain us for the moment, Paul. We want to hear what, what you have to say. But friends, this is, this is typical of human nature, by the way. If you take a course in logic... A good prof will remind you that, uh, that the more, uh, put it this way, the less informed we are on a topic, the more confidently we tend to talk about that topic. That, that's human nature. And the more you know, the more tentative you are, the, le the more guarded you are with your speech. Right? How many people do you know ha having the, f the slightest clue, they've never gone to med school, but they're going to tell you all about what, what you should be doing or not doing when it comes to medical things, right? Or people ha don't have any schooling when it comes to political philosophy, but they should be they're going to tell you all about what the politicians should be doing or not doing. And name it all. Look at, think about the jobs you've gone to. Think about all the details and nuances of your job, and you try to disclose to someone what your job is, and you have to just speak in summary fashion. And all of a sudden, they, they're an expert on your job, and they're going to tell you how you should be doing it, right? It's, it's just incredible. Well, these philosophers, they're operating like that. They hardly have the, the faintest clue what Paul is talking about, but they, they know enough that Paul's a, a babbler. He's a fool. They know, they know that much, really. They don't know hardly anything, but there they are. And you know what happens? This is a bit of a tragedy. People speak confidently on stuff they know nothing about, but that confidence instills confidence in other people. They convince people they know what they're talking about. And sometimes we elect such people to govern us. Horror of horrors. Will you ever go to school? you ever go to university? you ever go to post-secondary? And maybe you take a course in historical geology or physical or cultural anthropology or something, and your prof will, from time to time, he'll say something that doesn't make a lick of sense to you. And you're afraid to put your hand up and say, that doesn't make sense, because you're, maybe you'll be thought of as a fool. But all the while, your prof, has, doesn't, he doesn't have the faintest clue. He's talking like he does, but he really doesn't. And none of us should ever feel intimidated to put our hands up and say, could you explain that? Because that doesn't make sense to me. And I remember I was dialoguing with a young lady. She was in her fourth year of genetics at the University of Waterloo. And she was a complete Darwinist. And of course, I'm a biblical creationist. And we started talking, and I remember saying to her, well, listen, uh, original man, Adam, he's the first man. We didn't evolve from the apes, and that man lived 930 years. He must have been pretty smart by the time he died. She laughed in my face that, 
you believe man lived to 900? You've got to be kidding. She laughed straight in my face. Remember that? And I said, well, can you tell me why we age? Tell me how and why we age. Do you know? She said, oh, I don't know. I said, well, then don't laugh at me. If you haven't the faintest clue why we get old, how can you say that men didn't once live to 900? Well, we talked. It only took two weeks of dialoguing with her. I don't have a degree in, in uh, any of the biological sciences, but I know some things. I, I, I like to read. And you know what she said? She said, you know, at university, we're not encouraged to actually stop and process what we're being told. You've got to regurgitate it back on your exams, and you're never really encouraged to reflect critically. And you're sort of discouraged from asking hard questions. But she said, you know what? The biblical creation view makes sense to me. And she, uh, she became a creationist. And then she became a Christian at our kitchen table. I thought, that's amazing to me. And praise the Lord. Well, Paul took no offense, by the way. These people are calling him a fool. Basically. They call him a babbler. In Greek, it's a spermalagos. It means a seed picker. They saw Paul as the guy who just walks around getting bits and pieces of things he's heard from other people, and he's regurgitating those things. Like a, seed, like a little bird goes in the gutter and pulls out seeds. They, saw, they said, Paul, that's you. You don't know what you're talking about. You're just grabbing little bits of this and that, philosophically and religiously. But Paul, did, Paul was not offended. When you become a Christian, you have to learn to thicken up your skin. People say all kinds of stuff about me. I could care less. My job description does not change, <laughs> no matter who says what. Paul wasn't offended. He wasn't hostile to these people. He was uh, not combative. He remained respectful, and he sought, and he established some common ground with them. Well, I'll show you. Look at verse 22. Verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Now look at Paul's strategy there. Paul, he's looking around. He sees idols and altars everywhere. And he spotted one of these things with an inscription. This is dedicated to the unknown God. And Paul says, gentlemen, I understand that you're, you're interested in religious spiritual things. Hey, me too. I'm interested in those things also. Let's have a talk. I noticed this altar over here. It kind of shows me that um, you're aware of God, but you don't know him. But I know this God. And I want to tell you about him. That's very non-offensive, isn't it? The very fact that they had that altar means they're interested. Paul saw that, he saw that as his open door to talk to these people. And he took it. He walked right through it. So I want to read what, uh, what happened here from verse 24. Paul's going to explain who God is to these people. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, and he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And that's the end of the account here. Now, 
I mean, whole books have been written about this amazing interaction that Paul had with the Athenians. So there's too much to, to uh, talk about here in one sermon. But I want to cover the high points, the really important stuff, the stuff I think is really important for us. The first thing I'm going to point out here is that it seems like all men everywhere, all people everywhere, have an awareness of the divine. And uh, Paul will argue that elsewhere in his first, well, in his only epistle to the Romans, he'll mention that uh, as clear as you could ask for in Romans, the first chapter. He says that God has revealed himself and his divine nature to, to people's hearts immediately. And he has disclosed himself in the wonders of the created order, the law-like regularity that you see in the created order, the beauty and the reliability of, in the unfolding of natural process. God has disclosed himself to everyone. And uh, we have evidence of this, by the way, that people have an awareness of the divine. And I'll give you two avenues of evidence. The first is that all people everywhere live their lives and treat the created order, as though there is a rhyme and a reason behind things. Nobody sort of operates on a daily basis as though chance were ultimate, as though no one was in charge of the created order. We make plans for tomorrow. We just expect the sun's going to come up, you know, when our phones tell us it's going to come up. And um, we just sort of assume when you turn the key, your car's going to start. When you sit in a chair, it's going to hold you up. When you eat food, it's going to satisfy your hunger. Those kinds of things. You just sort of take that for granted. That there's a regularity to the unfolding of natural process. We sort of treat the world like someone's in charge and they're reliable. That's how we live. And secondly, I've never met anyone, in my experience, who doesn't believe that love is valuable and significant. In fact, most people, the vast majority of people, believe that love is the greatest of ethics. Love. I mean, there's a whole community of people, they call themselves the LGBTQAI++ something, something, and I'm not being funny, they keep adding. But that, but that community, they'll tell you love is love, don't stand against love. Even they have a dim awareness that love is the greatest of ethics. Love is valuable, love is significant. But think about it from a materialistic Darwinian perspective, a Darwinian conception of reality. Why would love be significant? Why would love be valuable? Love reduces down to nothing more than chemical interactions in physical brains, which are wholly determined by the laws of physics and chemistry. Why should certain neural firing patterns in someone's brain be valuable or significant over other neural firing patterns in physical brains? Why would love be more valuable and significant than itching or belching or some other biologically determined action? But, but you see, both of these realities that we see in all people everywhere fit very comfortably within a Christian conception of reality. On our view, there is law-like regularity to the created order that we've observed and expect to observe in the future just because we have a faith commitment to God. We say that, well, God made the world and he's reliable and dependable. That explains the way I live my life, the way I expect chance not to be ultimate around here. I expect some dependability around here because I believe in God. And my belief that love is valuable and significant fits very well within a Christian framework because the Bible says God discloses himself as love itself. Jesus Christ is love incarnate. That's why in our heart of hearts, we have an awareness of God's moral values and duties, all of which are an expression of infinite divine love. This is another big point I want to make about this speech that Paul gave to the Athenians. Paul insists that all people everywhere can learn more about God if they want to. You can learn about God. You can come into relationship with God if you want to. That's, that's Paul's message to those people. It's, it's Paul's message to the whole world. That's our message for the world. You can know more about God if you want to. You can actually get to know him if you want to. But you know what? Most don't. That's the sad reality. Most people don't want to. <laughs> It's available, 
Instead, they craft conceptions of God or ultimate reality that they like. And Paul absolutely insists, the Bible insists, that this is foolish. It's foolish to do this. It's hurtful and harmful to you. It's doomed to failure. Did you see back in verse 29? He says, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art and man's devising. The God of the Bible is so surprising. This is one of the evidences. I, I, I would advance this as an evidence for the reliability of the Bible and of the Christian faith. God is so unlike anything man would conceive of. The most brilliant philosophers in the world, you think of Plato, you think of Aristotle, you think of Spinoza, you think of great philosophers. And um, when they put their brilliant minds to the task of trying to understand what ultimate reality must be like, it turns out their conception is very unlike the God of the Bible. You know, like Aristotle, he would say, well, ultimate reality, this thing we call God, he's not aware of us. <laughs> he doesn't care about us. Plato said, God, if there's a God, he doesn't love us because love is kind of like a weakness, you see. He doesn't, we, he, he, Aristotle said he's an unmoved mover. He just sort of sits at the center of the universe, metaphysically, and everything else sort of revolves around God, but he's unaware of us. He doesn't care about us. When the God of the Bible says, that's not true. The God of the Bible says, I'm personal. I have a mind, will, and emotions, and I do care about my image bearers. I do care about the people I put on that planet. And the way God has chosen to reveal himself in the person of his son, Jesus, no philosopher ever considered that God might do something like that. That's very surprising. Paul says the creator of the world doesn't need our help for anything. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Do you know how countercultural that would have been to those people? <laughs> There's Paul in Athens. The whole territory is littered with temples and idols and altars. And here comes Paul very counterculturally, and says, yeah, you see all this junk here? God doesn't need any of this stuff. God doesn't live in a temple. God made the heavens and the earth. And that's a consistent theme. goes all the way through the Bible. You remember King Solomon, the greatest of the kings, the Davidic king, Solomon. Solomon made a magnificent temple for God, remember? And at his dedicatory prayer, he said, God, the heaven of heavens can't contain you, much less this house I've built. God doesn't live in temples. By the way, this is Paul now talking to the Athenians, saying God doesn't live in temples. Not that long ago, before Paul met Jesus, he was an enemy of the church. And he gave his seal of approval to killing Stephen for preaching this message. Back in Acts chapter 7. Remember that? I mean, that is another great evidence for the existence of God, the Christian conception of God. He changes people. Did he change you? He changed me. I have never recovered from my encounter with Jesus. Uh, if Pastor Gilbert were here today, he'd tell you he's never recovered. He changes people. He does something really in, in the world. He changes hearts and minds and perspectives, attitudes, personalities. He changes those things. That's amazing to me. That's an, that's an amazing evidence for the existence of the Christian God. Paul says he doesn't live in temples. He fills the heavens by the way, friends, that's the reason why you and I can come to a beautiful venue like this and we're not fearful that we left God behind at the church building. <laughs> He's here with us. And the Bible insists, and you know this is true based on New Testament revelation, that God does have a temple, and that's you. If you love and trust Jesus for salvation... God the Spirit lives in you. You become a living temple, in fact, a living stone being put together with other living stones into a beautiful, vibrant, growing temple of God, a holy habitation of God in the Spirit. That's amazing. No one believed, well, no one could have ever forecasted that God would operate like that. It's amazing, really, how close God is to his people. Paul learned that firsthand, didn't he, on the road to Damascus. The resurrected Jesus confronted that man, said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul says, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And Paul got the message, he never forgot it. 
This God is so close to his people, if you victimize one of them, he takes it personally. And Paul wrote a lot about that, didn't he, when he said, we are the body and bride of Jesus. We're so close to our God, our creator and redeemer. No fallen, unregenerate man, philosopher or otherwise, ever came up with a conception of God like this one. He's very surprising. He needs to disclose himself, but we're going to get it wrong. Notice this about Paul's message. It's so countercultural. He says, God is made of one blood, all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. And those Athenians are thinking, are you kidding me? You're trying to relate me to those barbarians? Surely we're of a greater stock than they are. I mean, that's racism at its finest. Paul says, no. God made Adam, and we're all descendants of Adam. That makes us all savable. See? Jesus died for the sins of the world, and that makes us savable, because we're all descendants of Adam. That would have been horribly insulting to these people. But the Bible insists that we are to honor all people. All people. You know, the cure for racism in the world is just get back to the Bible. <laughs> just read the Bible. Peter said, honor all people, the spokesman for the apostles. We are God's special image bearers in the world, and God has special care and concern for us, and he sovereignly placed us when he did and where he did so that we might seek him and find him. That's what Paul said. God's in charge. He put people where he did, when he did, for a reason so that they will seek him and find him. And Paul says, he assures us, and he's not far from anyone. That's what God wants. In Psalm 145 and verse 18, we're told that God is near to all who call upon him in truth. God is close to anyone who calls on him in truth. Not people who deny the truth, resist the truth, suppress the truth. If you call upon him in truth, he's close to you. He'll save you. He'll change you forever. He'll change everything. He'll make everything new for you. So Paul says, in the light of these amazing things, repent. God commands all men everywhere to repent. What does that mean? That's a, that's a churchy sounding term. Repent. What does that mean? It's just a Greek word that means think again. <laughs> just think again. <laughs> the implication is that you'll change your mind about God. You'll think again, you change your attitude, your opinion, your belief about God and about yourself. And you'll exercise faith in Jesus to the saving of your soul. And by the way, friends, we are under some moral obligation to use our God-given rational faculties and our moral sensitivities are right. Each one of us is obligated under God to reach true conclusions about the world and about ourselves, about God. And each one of us is under moral obligation to give honor where it's due. And the King of kings and the Lord of lords is entitled to the greatest honor. Isn't that true? We're culpable because we're sort of like the Athenians, aren't we? We know better. We give evidence that we know better. Paul actually quotes from their poets. He says, you, you, you know, you Epicureans, you're walking around like a bunch of atomists. And you Stoics are walking around like a bunch of monists and you're, you're super saturated with polytheism all over the place, but your own poets are sounding like monotheists. It's coming out in your speech that deep down you do know God. You have some shadowy awareness of him. You do know him somehow, some way. You're at least aware of him. It's coming out. You can't hide it. And every time I see someone talk about logic or reason or moral obligation or right or wrong or good or bad. every time i hear someone talk like that i'm like you know what deep down in you there is an awareness of god and his moral prescriptions and god wants you to f follow that find him grope for him find him he'll bless you for it because friends judgment is coming don't want to talk about those things but there's a god who made the world and he's in charge and he says he's going to judge the world he did it once in the days of noah he covered the whole world in a 371 day long deluge. The whole world killed everything. Except for what? Eight people, eight believers in a colossal barge we call Noah's Ark and representatives of every land dwelling, air breathing creature. A thin little vestibule from one world to the next. And Jesus Christ is our thin vestibule from this sin racked world to the shores of a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness forever. 
And Paul says you get, it, you get onto that ark through the exercise of faith. Just repent and believe. Believe in God's ultimate self-disclosure, Jesus. Now you say, well, why should we believe any of this? It's just another group of religious claims. There's a million different religions in the world. Why believe these ones? Paul says, God has given assurance of this to all men and that he raised Jesus from the dead. Try that one. Muhammad is dead. The Buddha is dead. Confucius is dead. Baha'u'llah is dead. Marshall Applewhite is dead. Joseph Smith is dead. They're all dead, dead, dead. The Bible absolutely insists that Jesus is not dead. He was, but God raised him from the dead. Stupendous vindication of every one of his radical claims that he made about himself. It's proof positive that he is what the Bible says he is. He did what the Bible says he did. And he's going to do in the future what the Bible promises he's going to do, and that is judge the world in righteousness. And when the Athenians heard this, we got a threefold response here, don't we? Some mocked. <laughs> you mean to tell me that that man was raised bodily from the dead? Are you stupid? Impossible. To the Greek mind, the body is a jail cell. You want it to die so the spirit can get out of here. Homer said there's no coming back. Plato said you don't want to come back. That thought supersaturated the Grecian world. So much for the idea that Christianity was born out of the pagan mystery religions. No. At the center of our faith is resurrection, which the pagans called stupid. Some mocked Paul. Some said, we'll hear you again on this. Like, I need to think about this more. Some were saying that probably as a polite brush off. All right, get out of here. We've heard your stupidity. But some believed. Some did believe. And they were saved. And I want to say, friends, that was a stupendously successful apologetical and evangelistic encounter. Stupendously successful. Why? Because God's man for the hour did not warp, twist, edit, or amend God's message. He just gave it to these people, both barrels. He spoke the truth in love, and he let God handle the results. And if that's you, God gives you an A+. Regardless of how people are going to respond, that's God's business. We are just called to be faithful ambassadors of Jesus. So speak to people intelligently, lovingly, sincerely. Let them know that you sincerely care about them. You found Jesus under God's providential care. You found the Lord. He changed everything for you. You want to see that for others. That's, I think that's fairly non-offensive. He blessed you. You want to see him bless others. So you share the message. And you leave the results to God. And that's my message for today. Under God's sort of blue sky. I'm going to close with a prayer. We have a final song. And I think Brother Steve is going to come and Give us some final thoughts here. Let's pray. Dear God in heaven, we're so grateful that we can be here together. Lord, thank you for holding the rain off. Uh, you control the weather, not the weatherman. Thank you for reminding us of that. Lord, thank you for your abiding presence among us and in us. And thank you, God, for your word, the Bible. It shines like a light in a dark place. Where would we be, O oh God, without your special revelation, the Bible? Thank you, God, for your word that gives us patience, comfort, and hope. And we pray, Lord, now that your word would penetrate every heart and uh, bless everyone who's heard it today. And we ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Praise God. Well, and God bless you all. Thank you so much for coming out today.